You're watching Culture Express on CCTV News. And now we continue our special series on Tibetan monasteries. Let's take a look now at Pauchol Monastery, which was built in 1418. It's in remarkable condition for its age and is famous for housing three different sects of Buddhism. Lying between Lhasa and Shigatse, Gansa is still a traditional relaxed Tibetan town. And the Pacho Monastery at the center of the old town is the main reason that makes Gansa famous. Pacho is a monastery that has the characteristics of Han, Tibetan, and Nepali architecture. It also houses three religious sects, the Sakyapa, Kadampa, and Gelugpa. The sects share the same main assembly hall and rooms for studying Buddhism. Yeshinima is a monk belonging to Glukpa sect. He's preparing for the upcoming dance ceremony, a Sakyapa sect activity. During every religious holiday, the three sects are not restricted to the limitations of their own group, but come together. For example, this monk belongs to Kadempa sect. It's his first time to join the dance ceremony, and that monk belongs to Sakyapa sect, and he is the one carrying ritual instruments. Every costume and Buddhist ritual instrument is clearly checked for the smooth running of the ceremony. Then the two-hour-long dance ceremony starts, with residents in Gansa town in the audience. The monks in the temple also join together in a Shotan festival held on the 18th day in the fourth month of the Tibetan calendar every year, when a great tanker is unfurled, covering the entire hillside. During the Shotan festival, the three sects in Paucho Monastery hum prayers, praying for all humanity. <laughs> There are three different sects indeed, but their origin is the Buddhist scriptures, the Buddha. Just like the water's origin is the snow mountain, so the three sects get along here in harmony. In Tibetan history, there were quarrels and fights among the three sects. But since the founding of Paucho Monastery almost 600 years ago, the three sects coexist out of respect for their shared religion as well as different doctrines, thus making Paocho Monastery itself so free and peaceful. Zhou Xidan, CCTV. Well, the Paocho Monastery or Potala Palace are not the only choices to get to know authentic Tibetan culture. Take a visit to some local residences. You'll directly see and feel the distinctive style of Tibetan architecture. Now let's take a closer look at some of the types of homes in the Tibet Autonomous Region. The most unusual feature of Tibetan architecture is that many of the houses and the monasteries are built on elevated sunny sides facing the south. They are often constructed using combination of rocks, wood, cement and earth. Woods are usually sloped inwards at 10 degrees. In old times, little fuel was available for heating or lighting, so flat roofs are built to conserve heat and multiple windows are constructed to let in more sunlight. Stone towers are built like military fortifications. The perimeters of these buildings are usually built in the shape of trapezoid for increased strength. They are usually two-storied made of stone and wood. The lower floor is where livestock is stabled. The upper floor is comprised of living rooms for the family, storerooms and a shrine room. Built for another purpose, ten houses are set up to match the owner's nomadic life. The frame structure of the tent house is nearly two meters high and is set up with wooden poles. The poles are covered by yak fur carpet in the middle of the tent's roof. Tent houses feature a simple structure, so they're easy to put up, take down and move. Zhang Song, CCTV. And China is a country rich in its diversified ethnic culture. Folk songs that reflect the customs and lifestyles of the country's ethnic minorities are passed down orally from one generation to the next. But now there is another way to keep the ancient tunes alive. Recently, a set of ballad books have been found in southwest China's Yunnan province. Let's go check it out together. These are the recreation of the original ballad books discovered by local villagers in Yunnan. 
They faithfully keep record of the folk songs depicting various life aspects of China's Zhuang ethnic group, from farming and religious rituals to weddings, funerals, and folklore. The folk numbers compiled in the books are recorded in both Chinese and hieroglyphic symbols. Thus, the books have their own significant historic and aesthetic value. One of my forefathers, named Huang Tingju, created several ballad books in the 1940s, but all of them were destroyed in a fire. None of our generation have ever seen a ballad book, but some of my father's generation did. It was like a notebook made from cotton paper with pictures and characters. Literate people read the notes, while those who can't read learn from the pictures. According to folk musicians, all the pictures in the ballad books have become a type of standardized symbology for certain songs through centuries-long social practices. For generations of folk artists, many of whom were illiterate, the pictures naturally connected them with the songs they practiced. As time passes, the symbols and patterns were perceived as alternatives to ballad notes. Using this system of notation, a musician can perform a new song after only a mere glance at the pictures. Artists say that ballad books feature more than 1,000 pictures, which represent around 1,000 Zhuang ethnic songs. Also, the numbers were well written with precise rhythms and rhymes. Li Xiang, CCTV. Chinese calligraphy is honored as one of the oldest and most condensed abstract art in the world. Known as Shu Fa or the Way of Writing, the characters contain the meaning, while the style of the writing adds artistic and spiritual elements. And for today's museum special, let's join our reporter Yin Chen for a visit to China's calligraphy museum in Xi'an, where folks discover more about the world of the dancing brush. This is how the Chinese character fly has gradually evolved from the ancient times to the present day. The complicated Chinese writing system has not only carried information throughout the ages, but also has transformed into an artistic form of expression. For a comprehensive understanding of Chinese calligraphy, you have to come here to Xi'an. Here you'll find calligraphy works that are older than the terracotta warriors. Spend an afternoon at the Xi'an Chinese Calligraphy Museum, and you get a condensed version of over 5,000 years of the art form. Now they always say pictures are worth a thousand words, but here we'll give you the picture, and you'll get the word. Founded in 1989, Xi'an China Calligraphy Museum is the country's first and only museum dedicated to collecting and displaying the art of writing Chinese characters. Covering an area of more than 33,000 square meters, the museum has a collection of some 2,000 works, from masterpieces of established ancient calligraphy to contemporary creation. The stars of the collection are the 663 imperial seals of China's first feudal dynasty, Qin. The little clay lumps unearthed in the northern suburb of Xi'an in 1995 clearly demonstrate characters used more than 2,000 years ago. Today, the museum is located right next to the reconstructed city walls of the Daoming Palace. Back there, now back over a thousand years ago, it was one of the centers of culture and of activity. Today, you can still sense the aura of times past, from long ago. Perhaps even right under our feet today, we'll have some countless relics or stories, or maybe even many unsolved mysteries. The museum moved to its new home inside the city wall of the reconstructed Daoming Palace last June. The site has witnessed the ups and downs of China's most prosperous feudal dynasty, Tang. The economic peak also produced a boom of art and culture, which included a free and diverse growth in the art of calligraphy. The museum's relocation project is in keeping with the new blueprint of Xi'an to establish itself as a city of museums. 
backing the ambition is the abundant heritage of the ancient capital Xi'an and an emphasis on interaction, as the vice director of China Calligraphy Museum has expressed. By the end of 2010, Xi'an had 127 museums enrolled to the 2009 China's List of Museums, ranking fourth. During the next five years, Xi'an plans to build another 60 museums, and more museums will be open free to the public. To enliven the rich resources, the key is to curate more interactive exhibitions to attract today's visitors, who are surrounded by various forms of entertainment. So I got in on the interactive part. With the help of the curator, I picked up a brush and got to my work. Take a look at this. This is a Chinese calligraphy character, and you can actually tell by the image. It's a form of abstract art. You see a head here and a body, arms, legs. That's right, this is the character for person, and this was used about 3,000 years ago. Today, I'm gonna go back in time as well and learn some Chinese calligraphy characters. The director of the museum will teach me. Let's take a look here. We're writing my last name, Chen. The curator has been practicing calligraphy for over 30 years. For him, writing is like using an inner strength to swing a brush on paper. The basic rules sound simple, but mastering them is particularly challenging, especially for me. It took me a while to get in the groove, and soon after, I got this, and this, and this. For calligraphy learners, particularly newcomers, a copybook of the style you like best is a must-have. Now, if you want to get a look at that, the museum provides some ancient stels, an invention to pass down the masterpieces of famous calligraphers. In this day and age, people are obsessed with efficiency and with speed. It's all about print and computers. Just ask yourself, when was the last time you wrote something out by hand? Well, it seems like calligraphy is something that's limited only to artists now. But actually, you and I can all indulge in this activity. Just pick up a brush and really let it take you away to a land of infinite imagination and inner peace. Perhaps therein lies the true beauty of calligraphy. In 1987, Falmen Temple was in the world's spotlight when over 1,000 relics dating back to 1,000 years ago were unearthed there. Over the following decades, experts have been researching the rare findings of the Tang Dynasty, and the latest discovery has unveiled the secret of the gold thread silk that was used to wrap the relics of Sekiamuni. The five pieces shown here are the silk that packed Sakyamuni's bones and the pearl-like beads found among the cremated ashes of the Buddhist spiritual master. They were among the over 1,000 pieces of findings discovered in the underground palace of Faman Temple. With a history of more than 1,700 years, Faman Temple is also known as the ancestor of the Pagoda Temple in the Guangzhou area of the lower valley of the Weihe River in northwest China. Over 700 pieces of silk were found. They were used to wrap valuable jewelry offered by seven emperors of the Tang Dynasty. Most of the silk are decorated with gold threads, used exclusively for the imperial family in ancient China. Deconstructed under the microscope, experts unveiled the thin gold threads are composed of two parts, a very thin gold foil around a core of silk, which is only one-tenth of a millimeter in diameter. An analysis of 200 examples helps us to see that the gold foil is not pure, but contains 15% silver. Zhang Song, CCTV.